The Cube at EMC World 2014 is brought to you by EMC. Redefine. VCE. Innovating the world's first converged infrastructure solution for private cloud computing. Brocade. Say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE, and I'm excited to have a Women of the World panel where we're going to just talk about what's going on in, in Women of the World, what's going on in, in emerging technologies, emerging trends, and I'm excited to have two special guests here, Stella Lowe, VP of Global Communications for EMC, and Nina Tandon, CEO of Epic Phone. Um, Folks, welcome to theCUBE. It's great to have you Thank on. You. Thank really you, Really appreciate much. it. Uh, Stella, we'll start with you. Obviously, uh, you're pretty busy this week. First of all, happy birthday. I know it's your birthday today. <laughs> it is my and birthday you're today. And you're celebrating by working mega long hours, yep. schmoozing customers, and obviously running this massive event at EMC World. How do yep. you feel? Oh, great, absolutely love it. And it's my birthday's here at EMC World every single year, so it's become a bit of a tradition now. So, <laughs> just want to just chat with you quickly about EMC. You've been now in America for a year. Yes. Okay, and a lot's changed. So quickly talk about what's changed for you and your role in your organization. So, yeah, so we've made lots of changes this year. We've, uh, we've certainly uh, globalized the team. We have, um, uh, uh, I think, 40 agencies across the world working for us, and, a, I, and I, I, I say it every day, I, I run the most phenomenal team, the I think maybe the best team in marketing, I'm sure my other marketing colleagues would disagree, uh, they run the best team in marketing, but I think I do. Uh, we've just run a two and a half day press program uh, for 300 press and analysts, uh, and yeah, it's, gone, it's been phenomenal. And, and I think one of the things I really like about what you're doing is you really have a global holistic view of the world. You're not just pandering to the echo chamber of one demographic or one market, whether it's you know the storage market or Silicon Valley or the yeah. hipsters or whatever. You look globally, it's pretty diverse. What are the challenges there? Yeah, there's lots of challenges. So as you can tell uh, by my accent, I'm not American. <laughs> I know I've worked for EMC for about five years and I've worked in EMEA and in the US. So that, that's given me a kind of good perspective. Um, but, uh, but, but also, you know, I, I go out to APJ, I meet the people there. Some of the challenges are language um, and, and, and culture. But uh, I, I think if you make people part of the decision-making process and you bring people as part of the creative process, then you can get over all of those, uh, those issues. Uh, we're here at Nina Chan, the CEO and co-founder of EpiBone, the world's first growing, living human bones for skeletal reconstructions. You're also the author of Supercells, Building with Biology. Absolutely love what you're doing. I think it's really inspiring for folks out there. Um, you know, I talk to my my young kids are in high school. My youngest, my oldest, is in college, and you know, bio is really hot right now with computer technology getting in the hands of this new generation. You're seeing people look at you know bio as a really interesting field, and I, just explain what's happening in your world. I mean, this is really super exciting. Uh, explain what what's what it's all about. I mean, this sounds almost sci-fi. Sci <laughs> well, uh, we have a lot of fun doing what we do. I'm a stem cell scientist. I actually started out as an engineer, um, electrical engineer. And so for me, I, I viewed cells as um, a different kind of technology that we could interact with, with our traditional technology. And in our case, we're using that to be able to grow living body parts for people that can hopefully um, you know, disrupt organ donation and, and, uh, and skeletal reconstruction and the like. Um, what I'm really interested in is how this same um, paradigm of viewing cells as technological partners is really disrupting across industries. Um, for example, fashion, architecture, food, agriculture, um, mining. I mean, you can use cells. You, there's, you can almost ask the question, can we do fill in the blank with cells and get an answer to a dizzying array of, of, of questions. So for me, what I'm most excited about is how kind of biology is breaking out of medicine and um, into the wider world. What inspired you? Because this is fascinating, because you're seeing that trend kind of now hit mainstream where cross-discipline or integrated disciplines, it's not the siloed, oh, the medical field, or, mm -hmm. or I'm in a computing field, I'm a geek. You're seeing a crossover. So what, what inspired you to do this? Well, I grew up in a family that was uh, quite geeky. Um, I also have two sisters that are colorblind and a brother who is night blind. And so I definitely grew up um, understanding with a preoccupation about our bodies being a technology. And so for me, I happened to follow that towards my field 
But I think um, a lot of people are preoccupied with this idea of how did we get to be the people that we are. So for me, it took that form of actually wanting to understand the biotechnology of our bodies. What are some of the things that you're seeing technology-wise that are enabling you to be successful? Obviously, you're seeing wearable computers just yep. now starting to see Fitbit, there's been some controversy around Nike making that, but you see, you talk about probes, small computing devices inside mm -hmm. the body, and then the stuff that you're doing is just radical transformation. What, what are some of the key trends technically that are enabling this? I think there's a couple things. One is that biology is moving forward, so we can, um, in my field of tissue engineering, we can imagine growing structures out of cells. If you mix that with what's happening in synthetic biology, which is in, you know, genetic engineering, where you can actually think, oh, let's think about the genetic code as something that you can remix, then, then you can start to think about things that you can build out of cells that are reprogrammed to do things that those cells wouldn't do in nature. So that's the biological piece. What I get really excited about is the interfaces between those living systems and traditional technologies. And that's where I think things like the Internet of Things, quantified self, all of that stuff is going to come into play when you start thinking about living implants for the body. So the big wow. data equation certainly is intoxicating. You start thinking about the, the, the benefits of you know, searching in real time, using data sets that you never had access to before, and some of the things mm -hmm. that we're talking here about at EMC World is about cloud computing, almost infinite mm -hmm. hyperscale. You can spin up a supercomputer, literally, to work on a project. Are you playing with some cloud technologies and data science involved in your, your project? Personally, no, but am I very much um, keeping my ear to the ground with what's happening? Absolutely, because if you think about what we're doing, I mean, for example, there's this company I really love called Little Bits, which is about um, putting pieces of electronics together to be able to make new systems for people who don't really know much about electronics. Um, their, ne their newest products are all around how do you connect that to the internet, right? So I think when you think about what's the next generation of, pa if a pacemaker is alive, Okay, as opposed to if it's electronic. Already pacemakers are speaking to traditional technologies because you need to download what's going on in that artificial system. But going forward, I mean, absolutely, we're going to have to start thinking, well, how, how do I connect this heart that I grew in the lab to the internet? How do I, you know, some of the systems that we grow are kind of doing the initial steps of that, but that's absolutely the longer view. Stella, I got to ask you, I mean, it's pretty inspiring to hear that. Absolutely. And I, and I have a couple more questions I want to ask you, give it a little breather here. But I want to ask you, you know, obviously EMC is enabling a lot of this. So, you know, as someone who's in the comm side of the business, do you kind of lick your chops and say, man, I got to stitch this really awesome story. It's almost too much red meat to choose from for the meal to, to bake out the messaging. I mean, I mean, what are some of the challenges you have? I mean, you've got some amazing storylines. How do you choose which ones to? I, I, I know, I know. And, and, and actually, you know, messaging is, uh, is something that we're looking at at the moment. How do we kind of, there's, there's so much to choose from. How, what do we want to be, what do we want to stand for at EMC? Because we're involved in so many different things. You know, we've talked about big data, we've talked about cl cloud, hi, how, hybrid cloud, trust. Um, and, and now we're um, you know, really kind of becoming specialists in, in areas beneath that. And you think about Viper, the controller, software-defined data centers. Um, so, so yeah, we, we are looking at our messaging and thinking, how do we clarify that? So it's not just uh, well, Area clear 53 for, and 52 help. I mean, you guys are they, showing they some they really do. emerging stuff there. Really emerging stuff. I mean, there was some fantastic stuff uh, yesterday. Think about what's coming out, simplicity, et cetera. Um, yeah, uh, uh, we, we need to make sure that we don't just communicate there with IT people, that we can articulate the business message. Yep. What are the business benefits of all this technology? And people like Nina, I mean, that you, you really see the benefits to society, the benefits to other human beings that technology is providing. It's very, very inspiring. So Nina, I want to ask you now, and, and still I want to ask you at, right after, is um, one of the things I'm personally passionate about is computer science. and. The motto of SiliconANGLE when I started four, four years ago now, going on our fifth year, is where computer science meets social science. And, and I'm to totally passionate about that. The other thing I'm passionate about is uh, young women in the workforce. You know, young, my daughter's uh, 6, 17, and she's a geek. And uh, I'm, computer science isn't always that clean to present to people, but now with gaming and kind of coolness of what things you guys are doing is, how do you explain to like someone like my daughter or other folks out there, what would you say to the folks out there that are, that don't want to be pigeonholed into writing code per se. They're geeky, but how do you inspire them? What advice would you have them, Nina, to my daughter and other young women out there that uh, are, have an affinity towards science and math and tech? May I, may I ask where you're based? Where does your daughter live? Uh, Palo Alto, California. Palo Alto, so great. Um, there is a biohacking space called BioCurious, which is just around, you know, in your neighborhood, and she can join it, and go hang out there and learn to play 
with biology. I mean, I think what's really interesting about um, computer science as an analogy to um, bio tech right now is that when you look back 30 years ago, you say, where were the garages? Where, you know, the Apples and the Amazons started, right? Where were they? There were garages, physically, where you might have made your desk out of a, your, your desk out of a, a door. But where is that for biotech? And that what's interesting to me right now is that that's emerging. There's biohacking spaces popping up in all these major cities around the world, including your city and including mine. The first one was ha happened to have been founded closer to my hometown in Brooklyn, New York. It's called GenSpace. And you can show up and over pizza learn how to hack DNA. You know, PCR and pizza. You can hang out in this but place. But it's not like eating spinach. It's really fun. It's more of a maker movement. It's, a, it's maker spaces for biology. And that those that popping up will really decrease the um, just the inertia around getting involved. People, you don't have to be in a PhD program to learn to play with bio. Yeah, it's fun. It's no, it's no stigma associated with being cool. Tech is cool. Absolutely, Hopefully. and anyone can get involved, right? Anyone can get involved. Women. Anyone. Yeah. There's not enough women in technology, and that's yeah. what you know, Women of World is all about. You know, getting women together to to uh, talk about. Um, you know, the kind of challenges that we face and, and, and share share our kind of interests and so our explain our the women of the world to the folks out there. I mean, yeah. it's an inspiring group and it's just got great people. Absolutely. So Women of World's been going about eight years and I and I, I wasn't there, but I believe it started with a breakfast with about 30 women, uh, yeah. you know, impromptu. Uh, and they thought, we've got something here. We should be getting women together more formally. Uh, you may have noticed, John, that there are not a lot of women in tech. Yeah. You know, may, may have, you know, may yeah. have we noticed. And so this is a way of saying, you know, it's cool to be in tech, uh, and it's it's cool to be in, not just in tech but in business to work yeah. in business, right? And and uh, but but what are the challenges? How can we uh, how can we share our interests and how can we network with other women? And by the way, it's open to men too. In well, the there are, there are today. tons of women in tech right now, but they're not just they're not there. I mean, if you look at the, the data on the social networks. It's 50-50, almost more women involved with tech. If you include involved, meaning they touch technology, which means they're exposed to technology. Yeah. So the question is, how do you get them onto a path that says, hey, it's normal, it's cool, it's okay. Exactly, and to study it as well in schools. So peer groups, some, you got some yeah. hacking spaces. Any other uh, ad advice besides just learning and reading? And what, what other things have you seen that have been successful in bringing people into a safe, trusted, kind of tech geek culture? I think toys are great. Um, toys are where we, when we're playing with toys, well, you could argue we're all playing with toys now. Yeah. But I'm saying when we first start playing with toys, it's probably before we know how to put a sentence together. And if we look at the toys that are available to us and that we are in the different aisles of the toy store, I think that it um, speaks a lot to um, what our expectations are of different subsets of children. This is my kind way of saying, let's get rid of the pink aisle. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is a lot of emerging trends with toys, with Legos that are rethinking um, boys and girls, with toys like Goldie Blocks and Little Bits that are making circuits and, and um, mechanical structures that are very complex, making that fun for girls and boys. And I see my two-year-old niece playing with her power drills that are made for toddlers. Um, <laughs> and I think, okay, I think toys are where we begin. Yeah, I, I agree. And I also think getting kids out into nature you know, my, my daughter mm -hmm. loves to, to, you know, observe the birds and, and the trees and everything else and really have an understanding of how they work and, and uh, you know, what, what's happening there, you know, why are the trees, why are the leaves falling off, what, what is going on there and she wants to know and it's, it's great to, to help with that curiosity. It's very exciting to have you guys here on theCUBE, really appreciate the conversation. Nina, I want to end, uh, give you the last word. Um, what is exciting about the future of building on biology, given that you're doing some really awesome things, um, pushing the envelope. Um, what do you see around the corner as you continue your journey? I see lots of new technologies where components that have either been involved in the manufacturing process or the finished products themselves are going to be alive. It's happening now, and I think it's really exciting when we're confronting issues of globalizing population, sustainability, longevity, um, just seeing what we can do with when we partner with life. I mean, if the first industrial revolution was about machines, and the second, you could say, we're in right now is about information, I'm really excited about the third industrial revolution being about life. And the humans at the center of the value proposition is about a human humans too, right, Stella? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right at the center of the digital age. It's, it's exciting. This is EMC World. This is the kind of action we have here inside the Cube. Uh, we love it. 
uh, science and, and math, doing things, rebuilding <laughs> biology. It's so fun, hacking bio. Uh, great stuff, Nina Stella, thank you for coming. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.